If you've ever watched a child learning how to walk, you notice that at the very beginning it doesn't really know which muscles to use and which ones not to use. So its steps are very tricky and very uncertain. But with time, it begins to get a sense of what's necessary and what's not necessary, which muscles, when you tense them up, actually make it harder to walk. Which ones make it easier? And you get more, the child gets more and more efficient until walking just seems the most natural thing to do. Because the child has pared things down to what's really necessary. It's the same sort of thing when you're meditating. At the very beginning, you're not sure how to get the mind settled down, and so you do all sorts of unnecessary things and sometimes miss some of the necessary ones. But over time you begin to realize, okay, these are the things you have to do, and these are the things you don't have to do, and these are the things you have to do for a while and then you can stop them. And it gets easier and easier for the mind to settle down because you understand better what's going on, what goes into it. Because what it comes down to eventually is contained in those, that list of three fabrications. is bodily fabrication, verbal fabrication, mental fabrication. Bodily fabrication is the breath. You use the breath to influence the way you experience your body. And as you learn to get more and more in touch with the breath energies in the body, you can learn how to deal with them. Particularly, this is where you bring in verbal fabrication. You think about the breath and you evaluate the breath. And then you notice the pleasure that comes when the breath is smooth and easy. And then you evaluate what to do with the pleasure, how to spread it around. So that's bodily fabrication, verbal fabrication. And finally, there's mental fabrication. There are the feelings, which we just talked about. And then there are the perceptions, the labels you hold in mind. Those are an important part of the evaluation. You learn to figure out different ways of visualizing the breath to yourself and perceiving how to have an influence on the breath without forcing it too much. And then you find which perceptions are helpful, which ones are not. And you get more and more experience in looking at your mind state in just these things. Breath, directed thought and evaluation, feelings and perceptions. And when you begin to recognize these things as you're dealing with them, to get the mind in concentration, you begin to realize that your other mental states are made up of the, the same sort of things. And this gives you a handle, especially on recognizing how to deal with unskillful mental states like anger. When anger comes in, one is going to have an impact on the way you breathe, bodily fabrication. And you find yourself talking to yourself. We don't tend to think in terms of like directed thought and evaluation, but that's what's going on when you, we talk to ourselves about something. We focus on an idea or focus on a topic, and then we comment on it, ask questions about it, make more comments, make, ask more questions, make more comments, have a little internal discussion there. And then there's feeling and there's perception, the perceptions that underlie how you analyze and evaluate things. Sometimes the perceptions are obvious, sometimes they're more hidden. But a state of anger is made up of the same kinds of things that a state of concentration is made up of. And so you can learn how to take it apart and readjust the, the elements if you want to get past the anger. You can do this on a quick kind of first aid basis. Anger comes up. First reaction should be, how is the breath? Years back we had a woman whose son was autistic and hyperactive, and as he became a teenager, he found that his lust and anger were more and more difficult to control. And she brought him up here one night and asked if I would teach him how to bring more control to his anger. 
And she kept saying to him, you can't be angry, you can't be angry. I said, that doesn't work. When anger comes, you say, when anger comes, this is what you do. In other words, if you say you can't be angry, then when the kid is angry, he's gone beyond the pale. But if you allow yourself, okay, anger is going to come, this is how you deal with it. First thing, you step back, look at your breath, so that that sense of tightness in the breath doesn't make you feel you've got to get something out of your system. Breathe through the tightness the way you breathe through any blockage in meditation. And then look at how you're evaluating the situation. Are you evaluating it properly? Could you be thinking in other terms? How about your perceptions? How do you perceive this? Can you change your perceptions? This is a kind of a first aid way of getting past the anger so that you're not bottling it up or not giving vent to your sense of frustration. You're able to step back. This is what we're saying this morning is one of the big skills in meditation is learning how to step out of things. Step out of your mental states and see them as constructs. And then you can reconstruct them, deconstruct the bad ones, and reconstruct something better in their place. Now, the same analysis works when you're meditating and you're in a quieter place and you can look more deeply into the anger. And this is when you bring in another framework that the Buddha gives, is seeing things, one, arising and passing away, seeing their allure, seeing their drawbacks, and then seeing the escape from them. So in this case, you want to be on top of the anger and notice when it actually comes. And notice when it goes. And you'll find that it comes at times when you didn't think it was coming, and it goes sometimes in the middle of a strong feeling of anger. Suddenly the anger stops for a bit. But because the breath is still worked up, we say, oh, I'm still angry, so you go back and ride with it again. But if you can learn to be more observant about things coming and going, you're also in a better place to figure out, well, why do you run with the anger when it comes? This is where you get to see the allure. All too often the allure of things, especially like anger, is very hidden. And when it suddenly comes out, we talked today about anger being scary. Well, this is what's scary, is you suddenly find yourself enjoying the anger. Even when you're, when you're angry at people that you otherwise love very deeply. The sense you can enjoy this is frightening. Well, you have to not be frightened by it. So, okay, this is the only reason why you'd be engaging in anger to begin with. At least you're beginning to see, okay, there's a sense of attraction there, and you want to see exactly what it is. And one of the best times to see it is when the anger arises first, and then there's something in the mind that says, let's go with this. And if you can say no, you have a good chance of hearing the mind's argument as to why it doesn't want to hear the no. Why well, just wants to push the no aside. Because there is that element that goes with anger. It's a sudden sense of release, freedom. You suddenly feel free to do what you want to do, and your sense of shame and compunction goes by the board. And your concern about the results, the long-term results of what you're doing, goes by the board. And when you want to say, why are you, why are you willing to throw those things away? The same happens when, if you notice when it stops. Why did you suddenly lose interest in it? What was the end of the appeal? And then if it comes back again, why do you pick, up it, pick it up again? You've got to see anger arising and passing away like this if you want to see the, the next step, which is that understanding the allure and then seeing the drawbacks. Because there's something in you that realizes okay, the anger is not worth it, and it dropped it for a minute. Okay, what was, what was it that saw the drawbacks? And when you understand, okay, this is what allows you to drop the drawbacks. This is the sort of thing that allows you to get past your passion for the anger. That's when you found the escape. So again, you look at those elements. There's a certain way of breathing that goes with anger. Do you enjoy that? A certain way of thinking that goes with the anger.
Do you enjoy that? Do you enjoy the perceptions? What kick do you get out of the perceptions or the feelings that go with the anger? These are things you've got to be very honest with yourself about. But at the same time, you can't be afraid of these things. You have to admit that, yes, you have some taste for anger, and it may not be the sort of taste that you'd like to have other people see. But you have to admit that it's there before you can get past it. And this ability to analyze your mental states first into the three kinds of fabrication, and then apply this other framework, which is the framework of watching things arise, pass away, Watch, look for their allure, look for their drawbacks, so you can see the escape. You apply that to the fabrications that go into, say, your anger, or greed, or lust, or jealousy, or any of the other unskillful emotions that you can think of. And you find that your hands-on experience with these different kinds of fabrication in the concentration gives you a leg up. And taking unskillful emotions apart, deconstructing them and understanding what was the lure that made you want to construct them to begin with. This is how we learn to get past these things.